Okay, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Or good morning, good afternoon. John Holland here from Pynchon, and welcome to our webinar on sustainability in the built environment. John Holland, Chief Development Officer of Pynchon, calling in from Vancouver. I'll be your moderator today. And this webinar is being presented as part of our practice innovation series, something we started during the beginning of the pandemic to share our lessons, pandemic related and now more broadly, on what we're learning about the world around us and how it responds in the, in the, in the pandemic and hopefully soon post pandemic world. As we all know, climate change is around us and we're being asked very, um, very heavily by many of our stakeholders to uh, do our work in a more sustainable way going forward. Uh, the built environment accounts for about 40% of um, greenhouse gas emissions, so construction and operation. So we have a heavy stake in the uh, future of the greenhouse gas, uh, gas game as uh, building owners, operators, and consultants. So today's webinar will focus on the issue of sustainability in our built environments through three lenses, building sustainability rating systems, well-being and, and building air quality, why does it matter, and innovative mechanical design and HVAC design. Um, so next slide, please, Kaylee. The, uh, just the Zoom tools. Uh, if you have a technical question to raise to one of the panelists, please put it in the Q&A and we'll try and address it either during or at the end of the webinar. If you're having technical issues connecting, please press chat. And just to verify that our audio is working, please could people raise their hands so we know that you can actually hear us. And the next slide, please, Kaylee. So we have three presenters today, Joanne Sawatsky, Valerie Johnston, and Andrew Burns, all colleagues of mine in different ways for different periods of time. And they're, they're gonna do a, uh, just a very good presentation which I think you'll find interesting. Joanne Sawatsky is a director at Lighthouse uh, Sustainable Building Society, where I'm on the, uh, the board of directors in Vancouver, an organization that focuses on regenerative built environments and the circular economy. Uh, Joanne has worked in architecture and most latterly in sustainable design. Uh, she was the first female built green Canada high density verifier and has taught contractor training through the Vancouver Regional Construction Association on sustainable building issues. She, some of the projects she worked on recently were the Whist Whistler Athletes Village in, in Whistler, BC, the Foundry and Telus Gardens Office of Residential Towers in Vancouver. Following, um, following Joanne will be Valerie Johnston, who works for Pynchon. She's the operations manager in our Oshawa and Peterborough offices. Uh, she's worked on a variety of IEQ and wellbeing projects across Canada for local and national clients. And she currently works on the well certification of a major commercial and retail complex in downtown Toronto. She has a BSc from the University of Toronto. She's a record registered occupational hygienist. She is a well accredited uh, professional and also a lead accredited professional. So very well qualified to talk about the rating systems, particularly around well-being. And the third speaker will be Mr. Andrew Burns, who is uh, calling from Vancouver. He's a project manager and mechanical engineer in our mechanical engineering group at Pynchon. Andrew is responsible for our district energy and heat recovery projects. Andrew holds an MSc and a master's certificate in project management. He's a professional engineer and engineer with engineers in geoscientists BC, a member of ASHRAE. Uh, Andrew's managed many projects ranging from feasibility to final design to construction, including the Blatchford Redevelopment District Energy System in Edmonton, which is a redevelopment of the old municipal airport site, Marine Gateway, a mixed use development in Vancouver, and Victoria Common, a uh, district energy system of residential development in uh, Kitchener, Ontario. So, with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to the first presenter, Joanne, and look forward to uh, the rest of this webinar. And we'll come back for questions at the end and a wrap up. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Pynchon, for inviting Lighthouse to be part of this webinar today. And thank you, John. As John had said, Lighthouse has been around for a while and uh, we are a nonprofit. And our role as uh, to be a leading, to be leading the industry towards sustainable built environments and seeking to be regenerative through the nurturing of ecology and human health. And we do this by uh, providing more than just technical advice and uh, green building certifications to our clients, but also by facilitating partnerships with municipalities such as the city of Squamish, the city of Vancouver, Calgary as examples, 
um, supporting their goals for sustainability, waste management reductions, or carbon reductions using a circular economy framework. And we also do conduct research, such as our latest GSG emission calculator and our design for disassembly deconstruction report, which can be found on our websites, our website, and um, as well providing educational programming such as what we're doing today. So I'm going to walk through just the landscape of sustainability with looking at business case perspective and rating system overview in this webinar today. Haley. Sustainability to me um, means that we are actually good stewards of the earth, of our financial resources and care for each other. So it's this three prong approach. And the built environment is where we actually just live and spend most of our time. So when we look at the built environment, which is individual buildings, infrastructure, communities, cities, and we look at through the lens of sustainability, the eight, they each actually have their own specific benefits and challenges that we deal with either through environmental, economic, or social. Um, as we know recently, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN body reported uh, recently the, that there's such an urgency on reaching net zero carbon emissions um, globally to reduce the surface temperatures that have been, we see as increasing, which cause the dramatic um, episodes that we're seeing in terms of fires and and uh, floods and a number of other things. So they're saying that we need to actually just look at going to net negative CO2 emissions in the next years. And so there's been a real push towards looking at the lens of, of sustainability through a carbon approach. But um, but sustainability isn't isn't something that is new, just so we all know that it's been around for a long time. LEED has been around for a long time, for 20 years, and it has been influencing the industry today. Um, there have been significant changes um, that we see that um, have been helping this. So looking at the progress around energy efficient buildings, ESGs, environmental social governance. There's also lots of battles that still need to be won, such as the carbon battle and deconstruction and looking at retrofits as being primary areas to look into. So if we look at it directly through the lens of a corporate um, strategies, and we would see the following which is the next slide. So we would be seeing uh, what CEOs are asking for sustainability and what are they looking for? They're looking for a way to report um, this corporately, uh, report it to their um, stakeholders, to trade if they're on, a, if they're trading their companies, uh, then there's the, the, just the, the, all the people out there who are trying to select which which funds to, to uh, put in their portfolios. And sustainability has become one of these elements that people are really wanting to see and, uh, and that there be transparency around. ESG is one of the, the metrics for environmental social governments. It's mostly used for traded companies uh, where they report on, an, on these primary areas. And what we're seeing that is that this is increasing substantially in the last few years. Companies such as TD, TELUS, Maple Leaf, Brookfield, Air Canada are some of the top ones that you see using ESG um, every year. And then there's also this disclosure. So disclosure, um, this has come through a number of different areas, but CSC, the Canadian Green Building Council is one of the ones that has been using this. And it's really focused around showing transparency. Um, where companies such as Quadriel, TrioVest, Concert have opened really up their books on their buildings portfolios and are showing energy, water, and greenhouse gas emission data and, uh, and sharing that openly to everyone to see, just creating that competitive market really and creating uh, interest. And then we have GRESB, which is the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, where they're also looking at energy. Now it includes waste, water and greenhouse gases. And this is primarily for property companies, REITs, um, private property companies, funds. It's really investor driven. It's a global ESG benchmark, benchmark um, and reporting framework. And investors are demanding this um, 
as a way of comparing ESG. And we've actually seen an increase in 2020 to 2021 of 22% more companies reporting on their GRESP scores. It's really about asset-wide portfolio. Next slide. And uh, some of the, prime, the companies that are um, top uh, rated across North America were Benthol Green Oaks and Oxford and Ivanhoe Cambridge that their portfolios were, um, were ranked as being the top performers. And uh, they, the data is available um, and there will be a report that comes out uh, in November of this year for all the results from all the companies and assets that are in there for our can across Canada and across the world. And that's coming November uh, in November of this year. Next slide. So what it does is it's benchmarking you against your own assets, against year over year, um, and, and then it also compares you to like companies with are, that are in your group um, and that are in your area of in North America or uh, wherever your assets are. And, uh, and it gives you a, a score so you can see how you're doing and, um, and it shows people, you can, it breaks it down even further than, than just the ESGs, but it really shows, uh, creates that competitive edge. And um, the other important thing here is that, is that uh, what you see is it's measuring, you don't see it on, on this chart, but what it really does is it looks at policies, leadership reporting, so at risk management, stakeholder engagement, around tenant and community, so health and wellness. They're adding in resilience now recently, which has had a big uptick, and um, GHG water and waste data monitoring and review. And they're also looking at building certification. So next slide. So um, if you have a portfolio that does have projects that have been certified, then you will um, get extra points uh, for a Gresby score. And then um, you you will be able to have a higher, um, just a higher percentage on where your score is at. So it, it's this is really leading the the edge of where companies are wanting to compete against each other, increase their their portfolios of performance, and be able to report to others. So you can see this is this graph is just showing in each of the different areas of different typologies of projects um, that are in the Gresby. Uh, portfolio of assets that this is where the number of what you see the green is where the um, the number of projects that do or floor square footage that does have a certification to it and offices um, have have the highest as you can see next slide so we have uh, an example so really just weaving this into where you where your business company corporate policies are and then weaving it into the, your actual buildings and your portfolios is really where the the I like to say we're moving we want to be moving towards is um, is how does this actually play out so we there for example there's one company that came to us that uh, has been saying that they're reporting on their sustainability components they have a, a an ESG metric they they're in the gresp and and what they're realizing that they didn't have some of their projects, their new projects that are just about to be finished, don't actually have a certification. So they're saying that they are doing one thing, but they haven't really gone ahead and pursued that. And so then they come to us and asking us, well, what certification would it be applicable to the projects that we're working on? Next slide. So let's just move right into the rating systems themselves. Next slide. There are a lot of different rating systems that are out there that can apply to sustainability. There's specific ones that relate to different areas, such as you know ParkSmart, which is related specifically to parking lots. There's Passive House that is not just for homes, but it's it's really looking at energy uh, performance and uh, air tightness. And then you have very very specific ones such as zero energy and zero carbon which is really how do you, you're just hitting zero for those projects and you get a certification for that. Build Green is strictly for, mostly for homes and residential developments. Green Globes is very similar to BOMA Best, um, where it, but it's also applied to new buildings. And we have others as well, such as Rick Hansen, which is to do with accessibility and Re Reli, which is resilience. 
and we have health and wellness ones as well. So there, this is only some of them, but this is this gives you a sense of that there are quite a few to try to weave your way in and figure out which ones work best. And that's what Lighthouse can help with is to identify those. Next slide. But typically most rating systems apply to this range of topic areas of sustainability. Now we're seeing more, pro more uh, projects that are really looking at it from um, adding in these other three, um, Okay, like, yeah, the other three, which are resilience, best business, pra uh, business practices and health and wellness. So really looking at it from a bigger perspective. So just as a quick overview of some of the rating systems that I'll go into a little bit more. Um, when you look at these, these ones, you can see the different types of projects that they can apply to, if they apply to new buildings, if they don't apply to new buildings, and do they apply to residential, commercial, or at a community scale. I think it, most people will know LEED. LEED is really the most common and globally known rating system. It uh, is leader, what it stands for is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's been in, around in Canada since 2004, when that was the NC version 2.0 or 1.0 that was in Canada, but it was in the US before that. I, I remember working on it back in 2002, and it really has helped to move the industry to a comparative sustainability framework and moved um, material manufacturers into understanding and reporting on, you know, their energy, not their energy, but their um, what's in their materials, their recycled content that's in there and their what's the health and wellness of their of their product. So what's the indoor air quality performance metrics of you know, is it low embodied emission or low, um, do they have low VOCs, those types of things. That's, that was fairly new that came along from the, from back then. Um, across Canada, this is how LEED is um, being seen. There are certifications um, in every single province um, and the territories as well. And so the uptick is quite large um, and it's, uh, it's really interesting to see, you know, that it is across Canada and there are just, it's so there, it, it's well used. Uh, next slide. So there are different areas of, uh, there's different types of rating systems within LEED and they can apply to new buildings such as BDNC, or they can apply to just the interiors, which is ID plus C. They can apply to buildings that are, um, are existing that are looking to certify themselves as, and they're looking at from a perspective of an, of an existing building. So you're seeing it in with a with a really fine line of um, what are your policies and your your um, performance measures, and that's your O and M. And it also can be applied to a whole neighborhood. So looking at a whole neighborhood perspective and how does that how does sustainability play out within a neighborhood, and they also go right down to the single family home, but also to multi unit family homes. And each of these rating systems will apply slightly differently for different types of projects. Um, and that's why there are so many different um, categories. So for example, a hospital would have a different um, way of looking at daylight and views and how you access the site and other performance metrics that would be required within sustainability for a hospital. Next slide. Yeah, the categories themselves, um, I mean, there are within each of the rating systems, you have a variety of different categories. And then within that, you have your credits and your prerequisites, uh, things that you have to apply. And within LEED, these are the sort of the areas that you look at. I mean, there, you know, see materials, you see transportation, you see sites. The one thing that we have been noticing mostly that has changed is really the, the focus on low emitting materials. Um, and that is the, sorry, the low embodied materials. And really when we look at that, it's the life cycle assessment of the whole building. And so they're starting to look at that greenhouse gas component within the building itself, um, the structure, the envelope, and reporting that out, not just from an energy efficiency perspective, but also from a embodied carbon perspective. Next slide. BOMA. BOMA-BEST is, um, 
has a rating system called Bomo Go Green. It was launched in 2005, and it's by the Building Owner and Managers Association in Canada. And it's delivered by the Boma associations, the local ones. And it's Canada's largest and most widely used environmental assessment and certification program for existing buildings. You can see this sometimes um, when you're walking into an office lobby and you'll see it on the, on the front door, um, the, the logo, or you'll see it on one of those signs within the lobby that says that this is a, what, what it, it's a BOMA best building and it has this rating. So it it's really provides owners and managers with this consistent framework of assessing their environmental performance and management of their buildings. And it's across portfolios. It can, it really, it's a questionnaire that uh, asks a bunch of questions and you actually have to have your performance data for energy, water, um, and other areas. It's really focused on the commercial real estate industry, which uses it the most. Next slide. And um, yeah, so it, this is across Canada, the, sort of the uptick of, of where um, BOMA has been applied, and this is just over one year. And these are the specific ones that were above bronze, so that are shown. Um, but there are over 5,000 buildings uh, across Canada. And, um, but what we have seen is that there's actually, usually it was offices that were mostly the ones that were using it, but there's been an increase actually in uh, the light industrial area. So you can see 337 light industrial buildings and open air shopping retail areas. Those are, so there's this, this change in where this is being applied. Um, universal just means all other um, areas that are not shown there. So post offices, hotels, grocery stores, in case you're wondering. Um, as I said, it's an online questionnaire. It's third party on-site verified. It takes about six months it requires to do, and it requires um, the, your data for your performance, for your, your energy that needs to be inputted in and your water. Um, so it's, the certification is good for three years and it's, um, it doesn't expire, but you do have to pay for ongoing certification. And the, so the categories are really focused around ones you see there. And it's, it's actually interesting because this one also includes health and wellness. Um, it includes things as purchasing, custodial, stakeholder engagement. It really, it's not just focused on that energy, water, air, waste, and site elements, which is, is nice to see because it, it, it means that it goes right into the heart of the corporations and the, and the, business, the business side of things. And, um, and as I said, I think earlier I said BOMA, BOMA is very similar to Green Globes and Green Globes is, uh, is what looks at, Green Globes looks more at the, at also uh, new buildings. Next slide. I mean, at Lighthouse, we've been seeing there's been a shift. Um, so not it, the focus has been a lot on the energy side and a lot on the water and the reporting on those things of the efficiencies. And that has really been improved. It still needs work, but it has really been improved. But with that focus area, it has taken away a little bit of um, just the people aspect of the building. So what we have been seeing now, especially in lieu of the pandemic, um, is that there has been this, this innate need and focus on really this focus on the people in the spaces and how does that really work for um, applying for health and wellness into those spaces and keeping people um, happy and enjoying their space. And so this is, health and wellness is really exploding is what we're seeing. And um, sustainability and health and wellness are interwoven now more than really ever. There's some stats that are out there. Um, where it's talking about increasing the asset value, increasing the value of your of your portfolio, and also increasing your tenant experience and your tenant retention, um, as well as as finding ways of better leasing. We had a, co a company once come to us, and it was through the leasing agent that was asking about health and wellness, um, and it wasn't coming from the development side. It was really coming from the leasing perspective of. You know, the project was doing lead already, and and they were wanting to figure out how to market better to the the corporation, the corporate um, sector. For this was an office, and um, and so there, it was from that leasing perspective that it came to us. Next slide. 
So there are two primary rating systems that really focus on health and wellness. And one of them is FitWell, which I find is very similar to BOMA, where it's a questionnaire and it's a little bit more straight, streamlined and a little quicker to do and, and cheaper as well. But it really focuses on, um, on implementing it into the workplace. And then there's also WELL. WELL is um, coming from, from more of the sort of similar to the lead end of things where it's very, um, it's perform everything is performance-based as well, but it's, it's just more, uh, it's coming from the doctors and uh, from the doctor's perspective. And so it's very, uh, it's a, a very interesting, the two of them, but they both require someone to go on site and have assessment done. And um, it's really, it's really, a, they're, they're really blossoming right now is these two rating systems. And you'll see that in the next slide, you'll see the, um, the uptick, for example, in well across Canada, Ontario is leading the pack here, and um, and as well across the, um, the from a global perspective, um, you can see in the brackets is the number of certified projects, but, and then blue is the number of registered projects, and that was from 2019, and it's probably even higher now. So you can see it's interesting. China is actually in that top three. So this is where we're seeing the market is, is going to be shift is shifting really towards and you'll start to see a lot more projects that are really pursuing this. Next slide. So we're just looking beyond the rating systems themselves and and I think it's important to um, to really see that the projects are are it's it's really moving beyond that next slide. And we really from at Lighthouse's perspective, we really like to see projects and clients. And municipalities win when they take their this three-tiered approach for sustainability. But we also want to know that they're focused on the goals that are important to them. And so it's really important to identify what those goals are in a project. And if a rating system fits, great. And if a, if a rating system doesn't, then it might be an opportunity to, to look at how you do that within your organization specifically. We also are really looking at a regenerative approach. How do we look at built, the built environment as nurturing the area that it's around and the people within it? Um, and that's us from Lighthouse. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about ESG trends now. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about air quality at the end as well. Um, next slide, Kaylee. So environmental, social, and governance. So it's a set of criteria that companies follow um, for policies. And Joanne talked about this a little bit. So just under environmental, these are just some examples of things you would find. So climate change, water and energy efficiency, recycling, GHG emissions. The social aspect really goes with human rights, health and wellness and diversity. And with governance, you see business ethics, compliance, and stakeholder engagement. Um, so typically, you know, a higher sort of score in these categories can attract more investors and potentially um, employees. Uh, next slide, please, Kelly. So balancing this, um, historically, we've seen governance as kind of the driver, like probably 30, maybe 20 to 30 years ago, people really focused on policies surrounding how we do business. Um, with climate change, environmental has really come to the forefront, um, probably in the last 15 to 20 years and in, in 10 years. But recently, um, most companies are focusing on the social aspect now, and this is due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So how can we make buildings and people feel healthier at work? Next slide, please. So um, this, these results here are from um, a survey called the New Investor Consens Consensus. So it's the rising demand for healthy buildings. Um, this survey was put together by the United Nations Bentall Green Oak and the Center for Active Design. Um, so they surveyed uh, investors worldwide, um, representing, I think they said about $5.75 trillion worth of assets. Um, to try to see what the trends might be. Um, so based on these survey results, the current ESG assessment methods, you can see here the ranking of what people are using globally. Um, so Gresby is being number one at 74%, followed by LEED and then followed by Energy Star. Next slide, please. So Gresby, 
um, has noted their assessment participation has increased by 26% uh, this year. Uh, they are noting that this is due to climate change issues and also due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, Kaylee. So back to that new investor consensus survey that was done, 89% um, of the respondents report that they're going to be incorporating more health and wellness into their ESG strategies. Um, and 74% of those plan to enhance um, health and wellness strategy through improved internal tracking of data. Next slide. So we're, like Joanne mentioned, there's a really a rising demand that we're seeing for healthy buildings. So based on that survey, you know, 87% of the respondents um, said there's been an increased demand for healthy buildings over the past 12 to 24 months. And 92% of them expect the demand to grow even more over the next three years. Um, looking at the bottom uh, right here, so who's driving this demand? Um, so 87% of office space and its tenants that are asking for this to have a healthier building. 61% uh, of respondents said it's coming from residential and 47% said the demand is coming from retail tenants. So again, 89.5% they're saying are investing in healthy buildings. Um, the, so the motivations here, I just mentioned tenant satisfaction is 91% the reason why people are doing it because tenants are demanding it. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is also another reason why they're looking at this. And why would you want to do this? Well, rental premiums can be increased by 4.4 to 7%. Um, if you include some of these healthy building things into your buildings to attract tenants. Next slide, Kaylee. So the most commonly tracked metrics that we're seeing to prove, hey, look, I've got this healthy building, our tenant satisfaction surveys are 79%, um, emergency preparedness, 74%, and then at 68% is indoor air quality testing. So people are moving more and more to doing more proactive air quality testing so that they can show, look, this is a healthy building that, you're, that we have. Next slide. So there's been an increasing request for proactive air quality assessments. That's what we've seen at Pynchon for sure. Um, and there's been an increased demand and interest for air quality sensors. So people are trying to move towards, okay, let's get sensors in the building and pro provide transparency around what the air quality is on a daily basis. Um, tenants are asking for this, they're asking to see the data. Um, so sensors are a good way to go um, or doing proactive air quality assessments at least annually so that you can provide the results of that testing to your tenants. Next slide, please. So there's been a large uptick in lead IAQ requests in the past two years, but also an increasing interest in wellness certification standards. So well and fit well, which Joanne had, had briefly mentioned there. Next slide, Kaylee. And then demand is being driven by the tenants and the occupants for health and wellness and indoor, improving the indoor air quality. Um, a lot of studies that have been done recently have said that, you know, if you improve indoor air quality, it can actually lead to higher productivity. That's lower absenteeism, improved employee satisfaction, and lower turnover. So that's it for me, and it's over to Andrew. Thanks. Have we lost Andrew Kaylee? Good morning, everyone. Kaylee, if you want to just share control with me again, I can uh, then click through the slides. Thanks. Great. Um, so welcome, everybody, and thanks for staying with us. Uh, my name is Andrew Burns, and I'm a mechanical engineer, with the mechanical uh, engineering team at Pynchon. And my passion is finding ways to heat and cool buildings more sustainably. So I want to talk about energy and ways of heating and cooling buildings uh, during this presentation. Um, so why are buildings important? Uh, well, buildings make up the third largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in Canada, um, behind only transportation and uh, oil and gas production um, in Canada. So, so buildings are a fairly substantial 
impact on the way uh, the fairly substantial component of the impact we're having um, on our environment. And of that emissions from buildings, uh, the two largest contributing factors are space heating and water heating, uh, both for residential type buildings and commercial buildings. Uh, you can see space heating is, is the largest contributing factor. And it's, it's something that we, we can work on you know, as a society, trying to find ways to heat uh, these buildings uh, more sustainably with less carbon emissions. Um, as Joanne mentioned, you know, the, a lot of the building certification programs, Boma, Gresby, et cetera, you can get points for finding more efficient ways to heat buildings. But it's more than that too. I mean, um, if we're talking about trying to uh, decarbonize buildings and electrify the, the heating sources, um, you know, that really goes beyond BOMA and, and Gresby points and helps achieve, you know, both um, provincial and federal objectives for, for reducing our carbon emissions as a country, uh, but also corporate object objectives for reducing the carbon emissions from a portfolio of buildings. So I want to talk about three things today, um, uh, how, how we get there to, to decarbonize these buildings, uh, talking about carbon focused energy audits as a first step, uh, and then describe some of the options available for low carbon electrification of buildings, which essentially means transitioning off of fossil fuels and onto heat pumps. And then I'm gonna share one success story, um, which is a project we did in Vancouver uh, called Marine Gateway. So starting with energy audits, I mean, many of you are probably familiar with the concept of an energy audit, but just to review, really there's three steps. Um, investigation, analysis, and reporting. And we start with investigating a building and trying to understand how that building uses energy, uh, what kind of energy is used and how much emissions come from that building uh, as a baseline. So that starts with a review of energy bills, looking at drawings and previous reports that have been done, uh, doing a walkthrough and meeting with operators. Uh, we take that data away, crunch some numbers, come up with some concepts to do a baseline model of what the building uses how much carbon it emits. And we look at concepts for ways that we can reduce that carbon uh, emissions and reduce the heating requirements for the building. The analysis includes concept design and financial analysis of these kind of measures. And then ultimately reporting on a recommended bundle of, of measures that could help uh, improve a building performance and help maybe address operational issues um, or life cycle replacement issues at the same time. So trying to find that kind of um, ideal a project that, that can tick all three boxes. Now, uh, you know, a lot of people think about buildings for the way that they consume heating energy, but I like to think about buildings for all the heating energy that they produce as well. Um, most buildings have untapped opportunities for heat recovery. Uh, heat Recovered heat can be used to reduce the net heating demand of a building. Some heat recovery options are obvious like uh, ventilation, heat recovery, uh, cooling towers. Uh, many of you probably operate facilities or have, have, have designed projects where cooling towers are installed and maybe they run all year, right? Rejecting waste heat into the atmosphere. So recovering that waste heat as much as possible and reusing it within the building to reduce the amount of imported energy that's required. You know, the modern high efficiency mixed use developments, uh, larger buildings have a lot of interior spaces as well, things like electrical rooms that need cooling year round and making sure that um, we're efficiently recovering the heat that's available from these kind of internal spaces within a building to provide heating to the rest of the building um, is a good, good first step um, in looking at heat recovery. But, you know, there are also less obvious um, sources of waste heat within buildings. Um, ice rinks, for example, um, have a refrigeration plant and there's a tremendous amount of heat that's rejected from you know, ice rinks and, and things like that that can be recovered and reused within, a, within the facility or within the campus. Um, also like uh, refrigeration loads from retail and, and things like that are often overlooked and can be a source of available waste heat. And finally, wastewater. I mean, wastewater is something we've, we've looked at as well. And every building has, has sewage and, and there's the potential to recover heat from wastewater flows as well in order to offset the, both the domestic water heating or the space heating loads of buildings. 
So these are the kind of um, projects that can be investigated as part of a carbon focused energy audit um, to assess like where the building is and what you could do to recover heat within the building. So once we understand the building a little bit better, once we understand the flows of energy in and out, um, sustainable heating and cooling is done often with low carbon electrification. It's something you've probably heard of. It's, it's definitely a focus um, uh, nationwide uh, as a way of, of getting off of fossil fuel based heating and onto renewable sources of, uh, of heating, often based on electricity. And why does this make sense? Well. In Canada, we're quite lucky. We have um, abundant supply of, of low carbon uh, renewable based electricity in, in many provinces. Um, this map that just shows you know, th those provinces that are largely powered by hydroelectricity or, or, or green energy sources, um, BC, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec. These are some of the best provinces in Canada to look at low carbon electrification um, because the electricity, the grid electricity is, is naturally so clean and there's so little carbon emissions. But even if you're in a province uh, like the Maritimes or Alberta, where there's a higher carbon intensity because um, electricity is produced by natural gas or coal in some cases, you can still achieve carbon emission savings through electrification using heat pumps, just because you reduce the amount of energy consumed so much uh, with a heat pump that you can actually still save uh, carbon versus uh, natural gas or oil or, or fossil fuel. Um, and also those provinces are actively working to reduce the carbon intensity of the grid electricity. So as more and more like coal fire power plants are replaced by renewables, the grid carbon intensity declines and uh, buildings that are heated electrically using heat pumps can benefit from that provincial effort to, uh, to clean up the grid. So what, what kind of, um, of heat pump Systems are out there. I mean, there's a there's a, here's a few examples. Um, many of you are probably familiar with kind of the air source heat pump option, and and this works in many places in Canada, um, uh, especially as technology is improving to to work at better and better at, at lower temperatures. But there's also um, oh, hydronic uh, water to water heat pumps, water to air, air air to water, all kinds of heat pumps that can produce. Um, heating and cooling from a low carbon energy source. And what would this look like for a example building? Uh, let's, for, you know, so here's an example of a, of a building on the left-hand side. Maybe this is the old way of, of heating a building. You have a natural gas boiler in the basement. Uh, you have a cooling tower on the roof. Uh, the building is receiving its heat mostly by fossil fuel energy. It's not a big change necessarily to the building to electrify it. Replace a gas boiler with an air source heat pump. Could even be you know, mounted on the roof or externally. It might not require any changes in the building at all um, in an ideal case. And that's part of what an energy audit, a carbon focused energy audit can help, help you understand is what, what this replacement might look like and what kind of impacts it would have on the building. But in an ideal case, there might be no change at all needed. Um, you know, it could be even as simple as replacing a gas-fired rooftop unit uh, with a heat pump version. Right? Very simple uh, kind of a retrofit strategy or more complicated maybe for buildings with hydronic systems. Uh, I want to just talk briefly about the, the financial benefit of heat pumps as well. Um, this is a slide comparing the operating costs of a uh, boiler based system with a heat pump, you know, considering say the same type of building with a hundred megawatt hour heating load. Um, this compares the both the gas and um, uh, both the emissions and the uh, the fuel costs of the two options. And as you can see, a, a gas boiler uh, might produce uh, 19,000 kilograms of CO2. If we were to do the same amount of heating with a heat pump uh, in BC anyways, where we have very clean, almost carbon-free electricity. The amount of CO2 emissions from replacing a boiler with a heat pump is, is tremendous. Like it's a 98% reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions uh, just by switching off of a boiler heating system onto a heat pump. And as far as operating costs go, um, it's fairly comparable these days. 
uh, between gas boiler and heat pump. Electricity is obviously more expensive and gas is you know, at historically low, uh, low prices. But even considering that, uh, the, the cost of operating heat pump uh, using electricity versus the cost of a boiler uh, using natural gas, it's it's fairly competitive. It's it's comparable, and of course, it depends on what region you're in and what your local gas prices are. Um, but it it's comparable. If we look ahead, though, uh, nine ten years, and this is really where the economics of heat pumps start to shine, is as carbon taxes are phased in more and more, uh, the price of gas is going up. And a lot of people maybe don't realize that, but we're at forty dollars a ton right now for um, uh, carbon taxes on uh, natural gas. That's scheduled to increase to $170 a ton by 2030, so a fourfold increase. And that creates a tremendous uh, increase in the cost of operating gas fired appliances. So, what might cost $2,700 in gas right now, uh, 10 years down the road, $5,500 for the gas. Whereas the electricity is uh, not, uh, not subject to carbon taxes, and so the, the cost of operating an electric heat pump is more comparable. Just included a little bit of, uh, of rate inflation here over the 10 years. So quite a savings in the future from, uh, from heat pumps um, compared to natural gas. It's like a 60% uh, operating cost savings. And you know, installing these heat pumps not only makes some economic sense, but it also helps with uh, regulatory compliance. A number of municipalities across Canada, uh, Toronto and Vancouver being two of the foremost ones, have implemented already these uh, zero emissions buildings targets. And this is an example for Toronto here, um, where starting from a baseline, they wanna see future buildings um, operating with significantly reduced carbon emissions. And this applies to new buildings, but also to retrofits and major uh, upgrades to existing buildings. So if you're retrofitting a portfolio of existing buildings, you're gonna to have to be trying to achieve these, these low carbon, uh, low greenhouse gas emissions intensity targets. In um, Toronto, they're looking for an 80% reduction in uh, emissions from buildings by 2050. Uh, and in Vancouver, they're targeting a 100% uh, reduction in uh, emissions by 2030, I believe it is. So here's another example of, you know, of low carbon energy at work. Um, this is an example of a retrofit project we were involved with uh, doing wastewater heat recovery for a recreation center uh, near Victoria, BC. Uh, this container you see here contains a heat pump. Uh, it transfers energy out of uh, wastewater from a nearby wastewater treatment plant and produces heating water for this existing rec center. This was installed as a retrofit project. All the mechanical work was done in a container out in the parking lot. So it was done with almost no impact on the building operation, which was an important aspect for the client. And I, I know there's a few municipalities and, and um, on the call. And so I wanted to include this slide because district energy is, is something we work with as well. And um, it's a tool, it's a fundamental tool that a, a lot of municipalities have in their, in their uh, their plan to achieve carbon neutrality. And uh, district energy offers a few advantages. Um, um, it's usually applied to master planned uh, developments or redevelopment projects. Installing the infrastructure at the time that, a, that an area of land is being developed makes the most economic sense, but it can also be done as a retrofit project as well. Um, District energy approach to, uh, to low carbon energy offers a number of benefits. Uh, one is like the economies of scale, you know, rather than a hundred individual buildings doing a heat pump or a wastewater heat recovery system or a geo exchange, you can, if you deliver it at a district scale, you can, um, there's a much lower cost per kilowatt of renewable energy capacity. Um, district energy can also have greater impact. You know, if you have a bunch of buildings connected to uh, to a district system, you can decarbonize at the central plant and immediately switch a whole bunch of buildings from a fossil fuel based energy onto a low carbon energy system. Um, and then you, finally utilities uh, offer more interesting ways of, of operating and, uh, and investing in these systems. Um, you know, if you have a district energy system, it's a utility grade product. 
And there are utilities out there uh, who are interested in owning and operating these things. Uh, they can bring financing, they can bring operational expertise, they can bring logistical support with you know, rates and billing and, and uh, regulatory approval. So um, you know, district energy is a useful tool to have in your toolkit if we're talking about um, decarbonizing the way we heat and cool buildings. And this may be especially um, in, of interest to you know, municipalities, uh, universities, um, airports, uh, hospitals, you know, people who operate a campus of buildings uh, where there can be efficiencies from, uh, from decarbonizing them all together through a district scale approach. So I'll share just to, to close one success story we've had. Uh, this is a uh, Marine Gateway project is a <clears throat> um, great example of, of a, like a modern, you know, mixed use urban development that we were involved with. This is in, in Vancouver. Um, project is, uh, is owned by PCI Developments. It's a 800,000 square foot uh, mixed use um, complex with two residential towers, an office tower, a retail podium that includes a, a movie theater and a grocery store. Um, and this, this building is heated almost entirely by, by low carbon energy through heat pumps and heat recovery. Um, and I wanted to share a little bit about how this was done. Uh, the project, as I mentioned, um, has both commercial and residential spaces. And so first piece of the approach was to recover the energy that we have within the building, um, recover the heat from cooling at the commercial towers and from the commercial podium, use it for domestic hot water heating in the residential towers. Um, also incorporated is the grocery store. This was identified early on in the feasibility assessment for the project that this grocery store would have a huge amount of waste heat available year round. So it's included into the energy center, into the mechanical systems uh, for the building. So the waste heat from the grocery store is used to heat the rest of the building throughout the year. And then there's a geo exchange system as well as part of this project that allows seasonal energy storage. So excess heat in the summer can be stored to be reused in the winter. And I, you know, I, I think this is an interesting slide to look at because this shows the heating and cooling load profiles uh, of this building. And you know, this is a Vancouver-based building, but I, I think the same conclusions can be applied to many similar kinds of projects across Canada. You can see here that there's quite a cooling load all winter long. And you know, as I mentioned before, this stems from those internal spaces that, uh, that have those continuous year-round cooling loads. And like a fundamental to the design and fundamental to the success of this project has been the ability to recover those wintertime um, cooling loads and repurpose them for heating in the same building. And so the performance as an example, like the green area shows the heat pump heating and it's, it's the bulk of the heating energy throughout the year is done by heat pumps. And the result is a 84% reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions from this, this project. So almost entirely heated by heat pumps, by low carbon electricity and the greenhouse gas intensity, um, even though this project was, was started in 2010 and constructed in 2014, the, it's achieved a greenhouse gas intensity of only uh, of under three kilograms per meter squared, which is substantially lower than the, the 14 um, kilograms per meter squared target that was required um, at the time during municipal uh, rezoning. So greatly exceeding the, um, the previous target and on track with where city of Vancouver wants to be in, in 2025 and beyond. And that's it for me. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Val. Uh, great presentations. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, one for you, Andrew. Maybe a brief summary question is how does a heat pump work? Ah, good. Well, a, a heat pump is um, like a refrigerator is an example of, of a heat pump that almost everybody has in their own home. Um, a heat pump uses a compressor and a refrigerant to make a hot side and a cold side. So just like your refrigerator, there's a cold inside and it's hot on the back. A heat pump is the same thing. It, it uh, uses a refrigerant loop to make one thing cold and one thing hot. So it can be applied for like an air source heat pump where you have a the cold side is outside and the hot coil is inside. It draws the heat out of the air outside and um, pumps the heat into the, into the warmer space, into the inside of the building. Thank you. I think another question on the same, same vein. 
Uh, it was mentioned in the case study, recovering cooling for heating. Did I read that right? How does that happen? And, no, that, uh, yeah, and how do you save energy in summer using winter? I think that's maybe the wrong concept, but go ahead. Maybe explain the heat harvesting, the cooling harvesting effort. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it comes on from the heat pump. So the, a heat pump is a really valuable tool because, it, as I say, it has a hot side and a cold side. And in the right conditions, you can use both the hot side and the cold side for valuable, uh, valuable work. So if you're producing chilled water on one side of the heat pump and hot water on the other side of the heat pump, you can send both of those fluids out into the building through the fan coil system to provide cooling for the office tower and heating for the residential tower simultaneously. So when you're able to use both sides productively, that's when a heat pump efficiency is is like really huge because you're, you're producing say three units of useful cooling and four units of useful heating. So seven units of energy with only one unit of electricity input. Okay. Thank you. Question for Val and Joanne, uh, either one can answer or both, uh, the time we have. Um, trends in sustainability rating systems, are we seeing a demand in, in certain sectors? And what attributes of sustainability are do we see growing in the next five years in terms of demand? Yeah, I mean, the trend is, it really is across the board, but it, I mean, Rating systems started with office buildings and then it moved into residential buildings um, for LEED per se. Um, and then it went in, into all sectors really, but where we're seeing it a mo like it, it, it becomes, it's, we're seeing it a lot is, uh, as it said in one of the slides, is that it's, it seems to be moving towards the, the industrial um, side of like warehouses and it's where the buildings are being built most or being operated most and wanting more lean um, returns. And I mean, people are still always important. Um, so when we look at it from the office perspective, we're seeing it um, turn into that health and wellness side as well. So it's lease leasing is really, is sort of pushing it as well, the leasing side. There was another part of that question, John, that I miss answering. No, no, you, you, you got the trends, basically the trends, the, the, the movement in trends yeah. that we're seeing. Uh, okay. I mean, you also have large organizations that are wanting to retain their uh, employees. And we're also seeing that, which is, you know, like you have the Googles and the Apples and the uh, Deloitte's of the world and that are also doing it. But I mean, we are we worked on a big project for the First Nations community just north of, just uh, west of Calgary. And they own a, a large piece of land. And that's where we created a sustainability framework for them, for that whole community. Um, and so, you know, that, that applies to any buildings that are gonna be built in there. And that's looking at it from a cultural perspective, from a sustainability, how do you connect to the land? Um, how do you, make it as sustainable as possible. Okay, thank you. Good. That's, a, that's a very clear answer. Okay, uh, we are back on 10 o'clock. Next slide, please, Kaylee, uh, in terms of uh, contacts and uh, questionnaire. They, here are three uh, panelists. Any questions people have, feel free to connect, connect with them directly. Uh, we answered nearly all the questions that came up on the chat during the, uh, the session. I apologize for the one or two we missed based on time. And there will be a survey sent out to all of you after this to get your feedback. We present these based on your, um, your preferences. We want to keep bringing you lessons that we're learning through the pandemic to benefit our community. And if there are things you'd like to hear about, please put that in the feedback and we'll try to address that in a future session. So with that, I'd like to thank the three panelists, Katie Schwartz in Winnipeg, who so effortless guides us through these uh, webinars and uh, puts them on and makes them uh, appear so well. Uh, go so well. And uh, wishing you all a happy and safe day, and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you very much.